And with that, we are going to get started. So today, um, I'm Kim Johnson. I'm the Vice President of Marketing at Igor. And with me for my team is Cheo Rogers. He is the Director of Business Development in the Northeast. We also are joined by Lewis Cotton from the Director of North American Field and Channel Sales at Transition Networks. And we've got John Jung, project manager at Walsh POE. And we will link to everyone's LinkedIn profiles in the chat function as we get going today. But let's kick off the conversation. Um, you know, we're all from quite different companies. And so what I'm interested in is just how do you define a smart building, especially when we're thinking about the office community? What makes a smart building a smart office, what makes that and how does IoT play a role? Um, I think I'd love to kick it off to Lewis. Uh, would you like to, to give us your sense of what does a smart office really mean? Yeah, I, um, yeah, no, thanks, Kim. And I appreciate everyone's time who's joined and, and are my esteemed panelist. I love that term. Thank yeah. you for adding me into anything esteemed, Kim. Um, no, so I, my, I mean, my pure sense of a smart building, smart office is, a, a space that is utilizing all technologies available to make that space either more sustainable, more user-friendly, uh, more healthy, um, you know, a range of things that benefits both the owner, right, and also the occupants, whether that's either right in an MDU, MTU, um, a class A commercial space where you're, you're, you're catering to employees. Um, so I think it's key that they're, you know, you're, you're out there as, a, as an owner trying to maximize the technology, which is what we do um, in that space to make that space a better place to live, work, play. Um, you know, that, I think that is, that's its purest form. That's, my, that's how I think about it. Great. John, do you want to add anything to Lewis's definition there? Yeah, I mean, ultimately anything that's going to interact with your employees and make mm -hmm. their experience overall better, like Lewis said. Um, mm -hmm. Anything that works with your employees from, from room, managing or room scheduling to um, vacancy, occupancy, things like that, and all interact. Yeah, Cheo. Yeah, I think really kind of added on to that and kind of coming from the controls end, right? A lot of buildings today have a little bit of smarts in there, whether it's a BMS, a lighting, maybe some other systems. And really kind of, I define a smart building as connecting those traditionally siloed systems together, bringing them onto one platform, having that data from it. And, you know, in addition to that data, because data is one thing, but also what insights can you put on that to make changes based off of that? Right. And let's touch base a little bit here. Um, you know, we're cutting the intros kind of short today since we've got half an hour, but let's just go around. And if you could give that quick little sniff into why your company supports that smart office structure, um, what you play, what role you play in that, um, that would be awesome. So I think whoever wants to take it first, Mimi, John, would you like to kick it off? Sure. So we do everything from design to the wire poles to the integration to the commissioning to the day two support. So start to finish, we do it all. We do the design, the engineering, everything. So if someone wants a smart office and they think it's complicated, stressful, and hard to install it, your company can help solve that problem. Yep. You know, I think that's always a good, it's always good to know um, companies okay. like that. You know, this exists because smart offices are today, right? They're not in the future, they're now, and there are companies like ours all together um, and many others who can who can implement this. And, and Lewis, do you wanna play the role, um, discuss the role that Transition Networks plays in that? Yeah, of course. And so, I mean, what we what we do um, uh, is we're the, the veins, the pipes of what used to be in conduit as an example, but we're now extending out from the IDF closet or the core, um, all the data and analytics that, that are at the end you know, whether that's occupant sensors or, or you know, cameras or lights um, that go back into the controls. Jay would mention, we are the conduit in which transports all that data, all that analytics, and also then now the power cord for those devices and those smarts. So, you know, in a, you know, one of my guys loves to say that we are the, you know, the extension cord of this new building. Um, so we're the transport, again, we're the, you know, we're the veins, we're the vessels of all, where all this data, all this analytics go, plus we, we power it from a networking perspective. 
And then from uh, Igor's end, so those are not familiar, Igor really is a IoT platform that allows us to power, communicate with various end devices and really takes it a step beyond just lighting, utilizing that lighting backbone, uh, backbone, but in addition, incorporating IoT shades, all these different kind of building integrations that we were talking about and really delivering on the smart building platform. Yeah, um, and I think, you know, we, we definitely have been known for our successes in PoE lighting installations. Um, I think that was one of the first, in my opinion, I'd love to hear your guys' but it seems like PoE lighting was sort of the entryway into that smart building and that smart office. You know, you've got the, like Lewis's team, like that physical infrastructure in the building. And then from Igor's perspective, we can help bring all those different brands and devices into control. And then, you know, from John's perspective, you know, we need, we need someone who knows how to actually execute that and do that. So, um, you know, that lighting as the backbone was a great way into smart building and a great place to start. And now with Igor's technology helping, you know, you can really enable so many more devices and technology on that. Um, so I think what's gonna be interesting is, um, let's discuss a little bit from maybe an owner's perspective. So you have an office or you have a facility, what are the key benefits to owning and operating a smart office? Um, Cheo, want to kick that off? Perfect. Yeah, so I think really touching on that, and obviously every owner and facilities manager, right, is different. Everyone has their own kind of problems or looking to solve use cases. So it really helps to having this diverse platform to deliver on each and every one of those objectives, right? But taking, let's say, a smart office, for example, and talking about, you know, very high level, a lot of end users are looking for sustainability, going greener, right? Improving employee productivity, having a safer and secure environment. Um, and then obviously now, with kind of the return back to the office, what technology and what smarts can and you just put in place to make it a more attractive place for people uh, to come back to, to that office. So kind of, you know, touching on all those use cases and then again, acting as this technology platform to help deliver on that. John, did you want to add or? Uh, actually, Cheo said most of it. I mean, it's just the operating expenses is what the help from an owner's end is what the owners really want to see as well. Yeah, the only thing I would add to that and that is, is to really beef going to John's point about the owners and, and, and maximizing profits is, and we kind of talked about this last week, was the sustainability end of it and, and the different incentives that are going to be out there governmentally to help owners, you know, get more money out of their buildings, uh, long-term incentives, taxes, so on and so forth, rebates. I think is the other thing that is at the end of this rainbow um, that will make these this really kind of you know grab momentum and scale up. Yeah, um, and let's think also from the employee perspective. You know, I think there's a lot of discussion around why should employees come back to an office when they've been working virtually, you know, for so long. You know, what's the compelling case? for bringing employees back, you know, and employees might not care a whole lot about, you know, building owner profits, but so let's talk about the employee experience in the office. How does IOT make their lives better and provide value in the office space? Um, and I, you know, I do want to open it up if any of you have a thought right off the bat about that, jump in. Sure. So, I mean, in our case, we do a lot of lighting. So the, the beauty of, of a smart lighting system be every employee can change their own experience. So they can change the, the color tuning of their fixture or the dim rate of their fixture or just how bright the room is in general. Um, every single employee in an office can have that experience or even in an open office, if they can dim that section of the light and they can have that experience of getting the light exactly how they want it. And I think kind of it's tying on to that. Um, obviously, besides better Wi-Fi and the commercial space, which I'm sure at home we all uh, struggle with, uh, but really just having that granular control to John's point, right? Having the ability for maybe, let's say, walking to a conference room without even touching a button, the all your preferences already in action. It maybe even happen 10 minutes before the room even goes in. Maybe certain people like the room a little bit cooler shades at a certain level and maybe we know that that person always presents the projector screens already drops down so i think really you know having that granular control and taking it above just lighting but uh, combining multiple different systems together 
Yeah, the only thing I would add, and I mean, from a polar employee's perspective and getting employees back and me leading a team of, of employees um, is, A, I think you have to get them back to the office so that we can kind of, you know, osmosis and, and learn from one another. But B, the only way to get them back is to make them feel safer within that environment. And to, to Chael's point and to John's point, right, you know, if a lot of companies are doing hot, you know, hot desking now. So if you have, um, you know, occupant sensors or heat sensors in there where you can know, hey, somebody was just there don't sit there, right? There'll be a green light above your desk. Um, that's the desk you want to go to when you're here to kind of have that team meeting. Then the, the, the employees at ease to go in and go, all right, my company's covered me to go in, engage, you know, grow together, but not also put myself into a weird spot where I might not want to be because I know where to go, where to sit, where not to go, uh, so on and so forth. That's great. And it leads into a question we've already gotten. So I want to further that discussion. How can IoT, and obviously we're all, we're, all of us here benefit from the PoE backbone, so power over ethernet, um, but how can IoT or specifically PoE enhance and encourage a safe return to the workplace? I think your best bet might be to answer that one. <laughs> yeah, I think really kind of talking about the safer return, right, is really just combining a lot of different of these tech technologies, right? So a lot of buildings will have these separate separate solid systems, but now with kind of PoE leveraging what we're going to already put in place for lighting, but now incorporating other things, right? Such as UV to disinfection, touchless entry, again, kind of to talking about maybe by having um, asset tracking, you could kind of, you know, where certain assets or, or employees are and before they even get into a space, uh, you know, stuff comes on from lighting, shades, all that incorporated. And also just kind of going into the whole well aspect, but really having more human centric um, aspects to their controls and making it a healthier um, environment. Yeah. Yeah. And the only thing I would add to that goes back to the, you know, the network now being the, the pipes and the conduit is that all the analytics are created in kind of the same system. So you have the power on the same system all those analytics that Chael's referring to are coming back and, and being literally digested and acted upon, you know, by different, you know, things that, that Igor does and whatnot. So that almost in real time through PoE um, and putting all that analytics on the network, uh, you you're, have actionable data that can, you know, literally day over the day or even, you know, from morning to afternoon, uh, make that make safer, better, whatever it may be. That's a great lead into another question we've gotten. Lewis, you're just doing a great job setting me up to help uh, answer audience questions here. What kind of data can be collected? So just kind of from the basic to maybe the more interesting stuff that people don't know about on a POE technology platform, what kind of data can be collected? There's, there's actually, uh, it's amazing how much data can be collected. So as far as occupancy, there can be uh, the daylight the, the lux level of the room, you can collect down to where people are in a space. Um, you can see if they're in a, in a conference room or in their office or wherever. Um, asset tagging per person, per computer even, or a phone that's connected to your Wi-Fi can all be traced as to where it is in a specific building. Um, I'm sure there's more that I'm missing, but there's, there's so many that can be so much data that can be collected, temperature and humidity, and it's, it's incredible. Yeah, and kind of tying um, onto that, um, kind of another on the IoT side, but spatialization, especially in a commercial office space, that's really, you know, a big appeal. And especially when owners are having a side, do we need more space? Do we need less space, right? How many employees, what spaces are actually utilizing? You know, do we need less conference room, more co conference rooms? All these questions go into that. So really from collecting that data, that's a great way to really, and again, have actionable insights into that. And all of this, and you know what I've heard here and something I think is worth reiterating, maybe your audience already knows, but having a PoE backbone that connects most of your devices does not mean you can't also have Bluetooth and Wi-Fi and other protocols, but you want all of these to work into one centralized place. And so, you know, when I think of the data collection, even from potentially an office liability place, if you're trying to put um, limits on number of people in the office, how do you do that? Well, maybe you actually have people counting sensors and that exists, right? And so you can actually utilize 
sensors and all this data to see if you're, the rules you're trying to set for a safe office are being adhered to. And maybe even getting as advanced as contact tracing. You know, if you have asset tracking for carts in a hospital, maybe that technology can be leveraged to, to try to track in a, in, a, in, a, in a way that's not too invasive um, employee interaction in case if you have to check, um, heaven forbid, that you need to do a contact tracing event. So I think what I'm hearing is that, that the uses of data and the collection of data is really limitless in an office location and it's almost more, how do you leverage it to make the smart decisions? Um, so I think what might be helpful is to actually talk about um, a project we've done. Now, I know we've all worked on a, um, some projects together and you've done your own POE-based projects. Um, so, so, you know, taking to mind some clients might, might wanna stay anonymous at the moment because they're, you know, big name clients. Um, but let's talk about a project, um, maybe from, from John, do you wanna start by when you go to um, actually install and commission a smart office building, what are some of the things that you think are critical to take into account for successful execution of a smart office project? Uh, I mean, really it's just planning, making sure everything's just all your ducks in a row and ready to go, get in there and, and get the job done. But um, planning from everything down all the way to the architect and the engineer in the early stages. Um, you want to get in early as far as talking to an owner um, and getting the job in general. You want to get early, talk to the owner, and then work your way through the job, um, do it that way. But um, we had pretty good success. We've done 60,000 square feet, 70,000 square feet um, with pretty good success. And Lewis, when, you're, when your team goes in to help a client um, do more than maybe just traditional office networking, they want a smart office and they want to use POE to do that. Are there any guidances or um, considerations you encourage those clients to, to think about that might be different from an old fashioned um, plain office installation? Yeah, yeah, no, certainly. I mean, you know, again, it's the visibility um, that we go in and present to them, right? Uh, the the access to the data and how they could use it. Um, the again, going back to kind of the, the sustainability of using it, right? I mean, we have a, an office where we know, and it was just two conference rooms um, in a partner, and I think they saved like four grand last year in power alone, just by kind of putting those two spaces on a POE network, taking them off the grid. Um, and, and utilizing that as a showcase, but also as a functional piece of their environment. Um, so, I mean, that's from our perspective, again, kind of being the, the you know, the fancy extension cord, uh, uh, that's a key piece of ours um, going into, you know, presenting with partners such as Igor and, and Wolf is that's what using our equipment will, will, will provide benefit to the owner and to the occupants. And to add on to that, as far as the, um, the power usage and, and cost flow. The we did a sixty thousand square foot warehouse or um, office space in Texas, and the engineer actually put negligible the cost of the lights on the permits and all the, the documents because it was just so low. There was really nothing to to put in there as far as price per square foot. Speaking of kind of that area, we do have a clarifying question from the audience. Um, when we talk about POE lighting, should we consider it in electrical standards chapter number 26 or under communication standards chapter number 27 or division number 27? It all depends on your local jurisdictions, to be honest. It's, we've, we've gone under electrical permits and we've also now gone under low voltage permits. So it's, it, it's very, very, it varies greatly depending on your, your jurisdiction. Do you have any recommendations, John, on how to approach a smart building that's maybe based off of POE um, that, because sometimes, because it can be a little different, it might not fit beautifully into a box. So do you have any advice on working with, um, uh, you know, local jurisdictions? So we've, we've actually kind of paved the way in our area as far as getting to the local jurisdictions because we've done a lot of emergency lighting which you have to work really careful with the electricians you have to work carefully with the um, the inspectors to make sure that they're going to accept the poe as as an electric as an emergency egress lighting um so we just we you just got to talk to the 
to the different trades. And we've also put our, um, our work under their permits. We've pulled our own permits for different things. Yeah, it's, you just gotta work closely with, with people working with on the job. Yeah, and if I could add to that, I would say, I mean, key from like the ecosystem of parts and pieces, the smarts, you know, the Igor transition side of it, I think it's working with folks that would like such as John and his team that understand that, but also then bringing in partners such as ourselves and, and Igor that we, we abide by these, you know, particular, because there's standards that reside that Igor has to take care of and we have to, like, for instance, on my switches, always on PoE, right? So there, there's a functionality within the box that if the box goes down, you know, the data stops, the POE continues again so that the lights stay on, right? This is one of these kind of, uh, you know, kind of rebuttals that we have to give out all the time. Um, and even there's things that we're working on downstream to make this more, more widely usable. Um, you know, being able to reset ports as an example is, is something key where the box can do it, right? you know, through analytics, through configuration. So they're, they're you know, UL certifications, right? Making sure you that guys like John, we're working together and that all the equipment is used. So, so, the, so the inspector basically can't get in our way, right? We're checking the boxes ahead of time to get the overall build deemed safe and you can, you know, we get our occupancy, right? So I think that's the key and Walsh has been awesome about that. And I know, you know, Chael probably has something to add to that as well, but that's the component about getting the right partners involved that can check those mm -hmm. boxes and not allow the inspector or the, the region to be a, a roadblock to the job. Cheo, did you have anything to add to that conversation about working with local jurisdictions? Um, just, just really to add, kind of, you know, just summarizing, right? It's really about having that communication and coordination up front. And then, you know, again, it's really different across the board. So something that maybe, you know, has worked well in New Jersey might be a little bit different, let's say, you know, Arizona. <clears throat> okay. Cheo, I'd love to um, take it maybe a slightly different direction. I think we're going to come back. We do have quite a few questions rolling in now. Um, but can you give an overview from a sales perspective of how to approach that first conversation with the building owner to open them up to the idea of a smart building office? And I'll start with Cheo, but I think everyone probably has something to add here. Yeah, for sure. And I think kind of, you know, going to that, it's really kind of doing research on who that end user is. Maybe they have certain initiatives that they're looking to target. Kind of a lot of owners today are looking for more sustainability or go after a lead or well, right? Stuff like that. So kind of figuring out what kind of that nice entrance point is and then really kind of talking to those use cases, how a smart building, how technology can really help achieve that. And then also just having a scalable platform where we can meet, meet those needs over a period of time, right? So maybe we can start with POE lighting day one, get the infrastructure in place, meet with the local energy codes. And then day two, once technology becomes more of a standard, we can add on these various technologies and integrations on top of that. I think, yeah, I mean, um, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, just, um, I've seen, sorry, I'll just add that, you know, I do see that um, usually there is something that each building owner really cares about. Maybe it is truly bottom line, you talk efficiency, maybe it's sustainability. We've seen a lot in the green space as well. Um, and this is a really compelling story. So I, I definitely think the value-based conversation and finding what those things are that are hard to quantify. Um, the smart buildings are so adaptable and can fit almost, um, can be adapted to fit almost any client need. Um, so Lewis, I, I'll turn it over to you to add a little more. No, yeah, the only thing I was going to add is I think Chao hit it right on the head is, is almost lighting is the foundation, but you got to get them to look beyond lighting. And even if they don't do it day one, as Chao said, right, they've got, you've got to sell them on that. You know, uh, I mean, a partner that I was introduced to by Igor and we work with a maker's cool sensor, it, it does vape sensing, right? I mean, in an office that you don't want people smoking, it's like, hey, so it's, it's, Lighting is that entry and it's the one that kind of gives us the heartache in terms of the, you know, to John's point about you know, inspectors and whatnot, but it's so much bigger than that as it scales out. I mean, even bleeding edge stuff that's not here yet, right? And, but like Li-Fi, right? I don't know, you know, I, I read about this years ago and it, it's not quite ready, but the military was doing, but this is where you're actually doing Wi-Fi over lights, you know, and, and these are the kind of things where you just got them to see, you have to see, people have to see that phase out. They've got to see the horizon and want to be there and know that they can, you know, they can kind of walk the road slowly. I don't know, John, if you got an opinion on that piece, but. Um... Um, not, not specifically on that. I do agree. I think that the expandability of it over time is you're putting that foundation in place 
and, and the expandability over time is endless. Um, yeah. One thing I did want to bring up about um, talking to the owners is we've had a general contractor, the general contractor we worked with on this job in Texas, they actually told us that the rate of failure was less. So they said normally when they get fixtures on a job, they have, you know, a certain percentage of, of fixtures that just don't work out of the box. And we don't have that because of the, the, the way our, you know, the way POE systems are built is you have that separate driver or node um, that is separate so that the failure is not there um, of, of a bad driver coming out of the factory. Um, and we got a great, of course, a question that is just something a marketer's dream to get, but an audience member is asking if we can outline briefly why Igor is a leader in POE lighting systems. Um, I think what might be interesting is to take it into sort of the arch a little bit about the architecture from the component perspective, what makes us a little bit unique and allows you know, us to work with partners who expect high standards in terms of reliability and function um, for their clients. So Chael, let's not take up too long, but give, give us a little bit about why Igor is leaning in this area. Perfect. And I'll, I'll kind of keep it to three points and uh, not get into the typical, you know, salesperson going on and on. But really, as we were talking about the whole time, really touching on John and Lewis's point on being this technology platform, so being a sensor platform, getting above just lighting, incorporating various smart sensors and smart devices onto our platform. Second thing is being open and agnostic um, and really help delivering on those use cases. So again, we don't pigeonhole ourselves into being just a lighting and only talking about that. It's, hey, how can we meet those use cases to Kim's point, bringing in the right partners and pieces to really deliver on that. And then the third one is having a scalable and flexible solution and really having the future proofing the space. So starting off day one, implementing simple technology, meet the energy codes, human centric aspect, and then day two, having that ability to add on once needs, budgets, et cetera, change. Um, a, another question that came in here is really about how to handle mixed use buildings in controls, um, this person's looking from class A office space to retail restaurant use, um, perhaps a little bit about the adaptability of this POE and smart building backbone. So understanding you've got a building, it's very mixed use, not everyone's an office in there. How do you handle that and what might that look like? Um, maybe from anywhere from an installation to the backbone to the control side. So I, I do wanna open that up for, for the panel. So we, we are actually doing a restaurant at the moment. Uh, we're right in the middle of it. So it, it's, it's there. You can do everything from, from you know, that office space to, to a restaurant. And as far as having them both together, you can separate those spaces. So it's, it's really as short of an answer as that. Yeah, and from a backbone perspective, I mean, I think it's, you can do dual architectures. You can have a centralized architecture, which we sell, you know, there's boxes for that, and then a distributed architecture. So there's there's not one way that 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 makes the deal, right? I think, you know, John's can do hybrid networks for folks, um, different sizes, different shapes, um, or just one all. So there's there's certainly ways to flex in and out of the, the infrastructure piece of it so that you can do a multi-use. I mean, and that's where we see a lot of um, a lot of upside is actually in the MDU, MTU space, you know, uh, hospitality and restaurants and hotels and so on and so forth. Um, so, Believe it or not, we are coming towards the end of our webinar. This is the beauty of a short kind of lunch break style webinar. Hopefully it's been a lot of questions answered. I would love it if each of you could just give me a sense of what you're excited about um, or, or what's next for IoT in the office space, in your opinion? Mimi, um, John or Cheo, would you like to start? Yeah, I can go. So, I mean, we've kind of talked about it the whole way. There's, there's no limit as to where it's really going to stop. It's just going to keep going and going and going. Um, I mean, everything from, from charging your laptops over POE to, you know, asset tracking and, and, and building utilization. I, it's, it's amazing where the, where the future is, is going to end up, but yeah, it's, it's endless. Um. Yeah, and to touching on that, right, that's kind of a, a great way to describe it. And I think the more and more projects we do and learn about more of these use cases and the ability to integrate to different technologies is just going to continue to grow. So it's definitely exciting times and really, again, getting out of just purely the lighting and really onto this large scale smart building approach. 
Yeah, I mean, I, and I'm, I'm, you know, that's, I can't really add much more than that. That was beautiful, guys, to be honest. Um, I mean, from my perspective, it's, you know, endpoints are, are ports. And I think from our end, it's bigger switches, more power, cleaner power, more analytics. Um, I think right now we'd love to get bigger pipes, right, and, and get bigger switches and, and create more data, you know, bigger veins and, and just give more intelligence and, and that we can act, you know, do something with immediately and make all of our spaces, um, you know, smarter, safer uh, for the people that use them. Right, because in the end, these buildings are really about the people inside of it, I think. I think that's where so much value can be had um, and anything from, at, you know, having a more premium experience for your tenants to, um, you know, a healthy and safe environment that comforts people when they come back from, you know, this post-pandemic world. So thank you so much to all of you today for joining us. There were some additional questions we were unable to get to. Um, I'll share that with our panelists and we will be sending a final email. Thank you with a few other resources and our speakers have been gracious enough to include their contact information. So you will be able to reach out to them if you have any questions on projects um, upcoming for you or other considerations for your office environment. So once again, thank you so much for your time from our audience and from our panelists. Um, I hope this was a, a good experience for everyone and um, feel free to let me know if you have any ideas for future webinars or topics you wanna hear about. So thank you all and take care and have a great, um, great rest of your day. Thank you guys. Bye.